Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Alman from the Mayo Clinic and happy to be here as part of today's fireside chat on uh, the future of hospitals without walls. And Rami Karjian is here with me and, and uh, is uh, an expert in this space and, and really uh, uh, breaking down barriers literally uh, so that we can achieve this. And this is going to be a casual conversation between two guys who, who have interest in, in this area. So, but one of the things I wanted to do, Rami, is, is kind of go back and, and, and you can feel free to introduce yourself to the rest of the audience. But I also just want to go back and kind of go through your journey of how you, over the years, got to where you're at now, really championing for more convenient logistical care for our higher acuity patients. But can you give us some of your history? Sure, I'll give you um, both a little my personal history and, and the companies. Uh, so my background, I'm an engineer. Uh, I'm in awe of the clinicians that we get the opportunity to work with and awe of clinicians who work with patients in, in hospitals. Um, I first started my journey in healthcare 25 years ago, working uh, on door to dock in a hospital ED before it was a thing. Um, then went on to run uh, the largest high-tech logistics company globally. Uh, and then with my partners, Andy and Raphael, uh, launched Medically Home. Uh, and our journey started because of my partner Raphael's uh, loss of his father due to a medical error in a hospital. And three engineers came together, a group of engineers came together with doctors and sort of said, how can we provide this care better if we were unconstrained? Um, and our whole idea was on behalf of patients, more care over a longer period of time without all the burdens of the fixed costs and infrastructure of a hospital. And that journey for us started over 10 years ago with our clinical trial um, that was published in 2015, uh, our first commercial customer in 2016. And then as you can imagine, uh, this idea of decentralizing care, especially for high acuity, serious complex patients really accelerated during COVID uh, and changed how we as providers, uh, as people in healthcare, but also as consumers looked at uh, the care that we would traditionally receive in the hospital uh, with a preference on every dimension to get it in our homes. Yeah, I think I think that is a great background. And, you know, from my point of view as a, as a provider, it's been interesting to watch when I was first a, a resident uh, rotating on the cardiology services, you had to decide whether someone who had a heart attack was going to be in the hospital for six days or four days. And the four days was really risky at that time, right? But every time you you try to do something quicker or sooner, then that sets the goal for the next uh, uh, next iteration. And so now people can come in and, and literally almost have same day dismissal uh, after they get their initial therapies. And then what you're doing uh, to try to get people into their homes uh, is just a natural extension of this. So along the way, let's, let's talk about pre-COVID because this, that, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But prior to COVID, what were some of the, the key pivotal moments or accelerants that, that allowed this to, to, to get to where we are today? Well, I'd say the idea of hospital care in the home isn't new. It's not new with Medically Home and, and our team. Um, the big change that, that happened was the idea of how do we use technology to enable the providers to, to, to give this care to their patients without needing to drive into the home. Um, with all of the support of all the logistics that comes into the home. And so what, what really happened for us is, you know, with our first, you know, separate from the clinical trial, um, as we started to do this commercially and started to prove for really sick patients that you could give them more care, care over a longer period of time and get better outcomes by doing this in the home, that that was possible. Um, and it's frankly how, how providers want to be able to give this care to their patients Without Steve, to your point, that pressure of, hey, each bed uh, for each day is $2,500 of fixed cost. Yeah. And the geometric mean for this heart failure patient, Steve, is 4.2 days and you're at five and what's going on. Right. In the home, you don't have those pressures. So the providers and the patient relationship is different. And then the other thing that, that rapidly became apparent is when you're living virtually with a patient in their home, you're understanding the whole patient, you're understanding their family, you're understanding the influence that all of those things have on their longitudinal care. Um, and and that, that gives so much more opportunity for clinicians to give care beyond just the setting of the four walls of the hospital where you don't have any visibility into that whole person and everything that affects their care. Um, and demonstrating that, demonstrating that commercially, having payers long before CMS reimbursed for this, having payers wanna reimburse for that 
you know, all of that was, uh, was very pivotal in sort of accelerating the movement for patients. Yeah, that's, that's really important. So let's, let's talk about that. So, so were you or who is trying to influence the payers to say this is the right thing to do? You, 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 uh, or did they realize that on their own after seeing some of the early trial data? I, I think the, the trial data and reassuring the payers that this is the best evidence care for their members is really important to them, as it should be. Uh, what's really great about hospital home in general not just our trial, but there's um, over 65 RCTs that show the positive outcomes from hospital level care in in the home. And so the, we've really used that and sort of the cohort that is, um, you know, trying to advocate for this model is really use that. And so the payers, once they saw how providers are embracing it um, and especially hospital based providers are embracing providing this care in the home as an extension of the hospital uh, and the better outcomes that they get that translate into lower costs, which they can then pass on to employers and others. Um, you know, that combination is so powerful. And it's to your point, what, what's going to unlock this going forward. And then when CMS said, hey, we're going to pay for this as if it was in the hospital at the same rates as the hospital. Um, you know, that really changed, I think, everybody's consciousness for this. You know, that's that's a great point. But were you surprised either... <laughs> positively or negatively at, at pushback or, or resistance from care providers uh, as you as you got into this space? The, the, the thing that's different as a, as a company trying to approach and enable hospitals for this um, than sort of the Silicon Valley mentality of, you know, fail fast and throw an app is, is these are patient lives. Uh, and our customers who are working with us um, you know, deservedly put a very, very high standard on that, and they should be skeptical. And there should be a high burden of proof to prove that not only is this better care, but that we have redundancy in that care, that our software meets all the security requirements that their EMRs do. Um, and so we were prepared for that. Uh, it's not surprising. It's it, it's very appropriate. What has been just such a uh, such a blessing is to see as our customers started to see the power of having a med surge bed in the home that was as reliable, that was as safe as the med surge bed in the hospital, the patient populations, the use cases that they came up with and that they've demonstrated um, have been phenomenal. And I'll I'll brag on on Mayo Clinic for a second. Uh, Mayo Clinic released an article last week talking about the first bone marrow transplant patient in the home. The idea that you would go from caring for heart failure patients and COPD and pneumonia patients and get the confidence and really prove out the model that Mayo would then say, okay, we're going to start doing bone marrow transplant patients at home. That uptake um, is such a blessing and and such a good example of how this care, if you can do it for the highest acuity patients, you can do it for everyone and to make it available to everybody, uh, really in the spirit of democratizing our care all over the country and eventually all over the world. That's so powerful. And, and, and it's been such a blessing. Uh, that's awesome. Great, great story. And thank, thanks for sharing some of the, some of the, the data we have. So, so let's fast forward now. COVID happened, as, as we're all well aware. For, for the stuff that we're doing with telemedicine and digital health care that's on the lower acuity end, uh, obviously that COVID was a, was a giant pivot in the world in terms of everyone realizing not only can we, but we need to deliver care uh, to patients in a more convenient way for all of us and in a more isolated way so we weren't spreading this virus. But at, at the higher acuity end where, where, where you work, did you also see a big uptake uh, or, or more interest in, in this path forward um, at, resulting from the COVID pandemic? Did. And I think what's driving it uh, is the idea at a, at a national level that our health system needed to become much more resilient. We needed to be able to tap into emergency capacity um, in different parts of the country at different times. And I think that's what COVID, COVID catalyzed. So all of our customers that are making this investment in this platform are doing so not just for COVID, but for the, the idea of having a more resilient healthcare delivery mechanism to, to decentralize care in the home. So whether it's the, you know, the next surge of, of, of COVID, whether it's a, a, an earthquake, whether it's a hurricane, other national, natural disasters, other pandemics, um, as a country, we have to make our healthcare system more resilient. 
And decentralizing care with telehealth is part of the way we can do that. And I think that's what, what's popped up on the national sort of radar that's accelerated this. Um, and you have to be able to do that for the most high acuity patients. Um, otherwise, we're too reliant on, a, on an infrastructure for care delivery that, you know, frankly, we 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 built up 75 years ago. Yeah, that's and that's a good point. That's a very good point. Um, one of the things that that we hear from particularly primary care providers and community providers is, is they no longer have the easy patients to take care of the ones that come in and, and are fun and they're getting higher and higher acuity patients, uh, not only on their panel, but in, under their actual scope of activities in a given day. And could, Have you done much work or, or tell me about, about everyone's thoughts on trying not to make sure you take patients who would be cared for by a high acuity hospitalist is now suddenly being cared for by a nursing team and family practice doctor who, who uh, you know, they've got a, they're busy as ever, uh, and now their patients are getting sicker. Okay. Have, have you had those kind of deliberations and discussions about how to, how to hit the sweet spot there? We have, Stephen. We deeply believe that hospital level care needs to be provided by those clinicians that have been trained and practiced and experienced um, in providing hospital level care. Um, and even, even to the point of ED level care and, 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 and that hospital care, it's not a fair expectation for our primary care physicians and their teams to focus on that. Um, and, and that is the burden that they have today with patients who are reluctant to go into the hospital and primary care physicians who appropriately want to provide that care, they get stuck with that. And so hospitals that are adopting this model are, are creating a new outlet for primary care where they can, with a lot of confidence, move their patients into that decentralized care in their home and stay connected into it. So one of the things that the primary care physicians love about this model is a lot of our customers have enabled their, their PCPs to do the check-in visit on day three or day four of being hospitalized in your home. And yeah. so your, your PCP is still involved. They still have visibility in what goes on. And from the patient's perspective, you're still in that bubble that your PCP is providing and, and they're longitudinally managing the care. And frankly, they don't get a patient that's dumped back on them uh, right. that was discharged too early from the hospital either. Uh, and so we really view this as enabling the PCP to really get into how they manage the chronic care of the patient, um, enabling them to really get into what's now called social determinants of health, mm -hmm. sort of those underlying factors, while still having the ability to make sure their patients are getting great, great care in their homes that they would otherwise get in institutional sites. Yeah, and, and I think that the, this technology, allow, as you mentioned, allows the, the primary care provider to actually round on the patient in a way that's logistically easier for them. But we, I know we're still working together on trying to figure out what's the best way to, to transition a patient, regardless of whether they're getting sicker or less sick and making sure that all those, what used to be handoffs are really a, a continuum of, and flow of care now is, is really a, a goal that we all need to strive for. And, and, and how do we, I mean, really, we should as a system be looking at, at eliminating those transitions um, uh, or, or at least making them much less visible to the patient. You know, today in the old world, it was, it was very jarring. You, you were being cared for by your PCP, and then you ended up in a different building in a different bed. And five days later, they were done with you and you're back at home, but you can't see your PCP for another week. Very, very jarring. I think as, as, as a community, the idea of making those transitions disappear we now have the technology, we have the capabilities to send care into the home such that those transitions should no longer be visible to the patient or, frankly, the, the providers that care for them. Yeah. Let's, let's shift a bit and talk about, uh, and you mentioned social determinants, and it, and it struck me another question I wanted to ask you about network, broadband, technical capabilities, and, and how much of a barrier do you think that is? And do you think things like 5G are going to make a difference for this? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think first, it's incumbent that this care be available to everybody, regardless of where they live. Um, it's incumbent that the specialist care is also available to them, integrated in with this model, regardless of where they live. Um, and so, you know, we've got to overcome the technology and other barriers to that. So as we get more broadband penetration, as we get more 5G penetration, that'll help a lot. Um, and in fact, we're even looking at um, mobile satellite uh, that we can provide to bridge the gap to getting broadband in a home when a hospitalization starts in very rural areas. 
Um, so I think, Steve, the theme that you're saying, which is we've got to be breaking down those barriers so that this care is available regardless of where you live, so that the, the care that you get in rural Oklahoma is the same as the care that you would get in Boston or in Rochester or in Jacksonville. Um, that's what we've got to strive for. And we're never going to get there by building more buildings because we're not going to be able to build enough buildings to reach all the rural communities and underserved communities that need them. So this is the model. Um, and the technology gaps are closing very, very fast. Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's true. Are, are you seeing other other patient side barriers to right now other than the technology that are barriers to this type of access? The the ones that we're working on is if if the home is not an appropriate site for this care, that it's not going to be safe, or you have a population without a home, how can we leverage respite sites? so that we're not relying on that. Um, whether that is you know, church or other religious organizations, other community facilities, um, hotels, uh, yeah. how, how do we make this so that the idea is not, we call it hospital at home, what it really is is decentralized care outside of institutional facilities. Right. Um, and, and so we're trying to be very creative about that so that even having a home isn't a prerequisite for receiving this type of care with better outcomes outside of a traditional brick and mortar hospital. Got it. Got it. What do you, what do you see in the forefront in terms of um, reimbursement? I mean, we, we've talked about that previously, but now coming out of COVID when there's a lot more awareness and, and many of the payers uh, are more interested in that. And, and maybe in, in your response to that also talk about, do you see differences in, adoption or, or pushing the boundary on this, depending on whether the system is a fee for service or, or risk management based uh, a system? What, what are your thoughts? It's such an interesting question. We, we, we spent a whole half hour just on that. A, a few things. One is, we don't believe that hospitals and health systems can be viable without taking risk um, uh, going forward. So we know that that's happening. Um, we also know that the payers where when we started on this journey, the payers were finding ways to accommodate this and make this work for those early adopters. Now the tides have turned and the payers are going to their health system and hospital partners and saying, you've got to do this. And mm. here we are, we're set up to do this. And when are you going to do this? In fact, we had one customer who said to us, look, five years from now, CMS isn't going to reimburse us for low acuity pneumonia in a brick and mortar hospital. So this isn't a question of, of, of if we need to do this, it's, it's when and, and how. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I really applaud the team at CMS to, to sort of set a new bar by providing the reimbursement for this. And there's a lot of people at CMS. Uh, there's a lot of legislators that are working on making sure this reimbursement is last beyond the PHE. Um, mm -hmm. But even if it doesn't, uh, the commercial payers are going to start to demand it and employers are going to start to demand it of the commercial payers because consumers now have an awareness of this and they're going to drive this. So it's no longer provider-led or payer-led. It's really being consumer-led. Right. No, I, I, I agree with that completely. We are seeing that from our patients now. They're calling for appointments and saying, well, can I do this from home as their preference rather than when can I get to Rochester for a, a whole slew of tests and consultations? So I, I do believe it'll be a consumer-led push and your, your insights into the way that reflects in the employers and then the secondary payers is, is right on. So, so um, what other challenges do you think that we're going to have to face in the next three to five years to really continue the momentum that you're seeing? I don't think the channel challenges are clinical in nature. Um, as you know, providers love this, patients love this, uh, and we're going to go see more and more adoption and more and more creative uses of decentralizing this care into the home. Um, the challenge that we're going to have at a macro level as a country and for individual systems, what do we do with these real estate assets? Um, as better care and more care is provided in the home, we need less and less those real estate assets we have across the, the, the country. Um, we don't need as many physical hospitals and our beds as a country are in the wrong places. And so the biggest challenge that I see is as the providers and the consumers and the payers drive this movement, Steve, how do we help the people who own those assets reconfigure them and make them productive 
for this new era that we're in where consumers, providers, payers are preferring high acuity care in their home. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the other thing that I, I also see is that we're going to see different care team talents and relationships. And, and you know, everyone, in, particularly in healthcare, as you mentioned, should be risk averse, should be skeptical. But we've, you know, we've worked at Mayo for over 150 years in a model that works really well and trying to convince people that an advanced nursing team can take care of this giant panel of patients and how how many physicians or nurse practitioners or PAs do you need to supervise those nurses? And, and, and maybe you need different skill sets than you had in the traditional model. I think that, that transitioning that training uh, and development of the workforce to, to meet those needs is one of the other things that's in evolution right now, for sure. And, and I think the, that's such a good point. As providers, nurses, others, see the impact that they can have on patients and their family with this model, they're going to gravitate for it. Um, They're going to ask um, med schools to train them for it. They're going to ask their hospitals to provide them the ability to rotate in on this. So so I think everyone should have a very high bar of making sure that this is in the best interest of the patients and their families. Uh, And then I think over and over, there's lots of wonderful examples in healthcare of, of where the excitement of the clinicians and the providers just sort of create that that movement towards it. Yeah, I was I was giving a, a talk at the uh, Association of Academic Medical Centers a few years ago in, in Sweden, and they were after my talk. One of the attendees said, "We're just now interviewing for our next class of medical students. So, with all the digital healthcare you see, what what should we be looking for in candidates? And my answer, well, a little bit tongue in cheek was, you need to look for candidates who are gonna be doing a different job than they think they're interviewing for right now. Because you know the, the traditional white coats uh, in, in, in the hospital for you know 80 hours a week, whatever, uh, they're gonna be doing something completely different than that. Uh, and, and that I think you are uh, saying the same thing in reality today that we're changing the way care is delivered. I love that, Steve. What a what a what a great framing. Yeah. So so as we as we wrap up, is there is there anything that we should be talking about that I haven't asked you today that you want to want to conclude with? I think the I want to go back to your comment about five G and and really the point behind it, which is um, we need to be talking about making sure that this care is available to populations outside of um, our typical urban centers. Um, it needs to be available to those populations that are outside of those that are typically having the most access to care. Um, and so, you know, I, I applaud so many of the institutions that as they adopt this model, they use it as a catalyst for reaching out more um, to their underserved populations for addressing the health equity challenges that we have in our country and, and globally. Um, and so I think that that needs appropriately a lot of focus, uh, and many, many people are giving it that focus, but I think that's that's the other thing. Every time we talk about improvements in, in healthcare delivery and improvements in outcomes, right behind it need to be how are we driving this improvement almost disproportionately to underserved populations to address the health equity challenges that, that everyone is all too familiar with, um, and I, I, that's why I really appreciate that you brought up that point. Yeah, that's that. That is that is a great point. We this really can serve as a game changer in terms of if we do this right, providing access to people who previously weren't able to to get the level of care, level of specialization, or even access at all. Uh, so, I think I think Rami, I've really appreciated this conversation. I wish we had you know half a day to sit around and, and chat and uh, and and figure out where this evolution that we're living. Uh, and, and healthcare delivery is going. But thank you so much for your time and for your thoughts and, and for all your efforts. Oh, thank you, Steve. And thank you for everything you're doing.